What foods are most harmful to your body? Stick around, I'm gonna give you the three foods that you need to eliminate from your diet. Welcome back, all right, here we go. Number one, gluten. I think by now everybody's heard the word gluten, uh, but what's the issue? What's really going on? It's important for all species to have defense mechanisms, right? Animals could fight or, or run, and same with humans. Uh, but plants are a little bit of a, a disadvantage. They can't run, they can't fight. So they have to produce their own defense mechanisms. All right, what they do is they produce toxins. Toxins that um, hurt the individual that try to eat them. So for example, uh, many plants produce the toxin gluten. Uh, gluten is a protein that's found in many of our grains that we eat from barley, wheat, uh, rice, even some of our oats and corn, all right, and gluten has a tremendous amount of effects on, on the human body. Some of these protective and defense mechanisms involve the productions of toxins that uh, damage the lining of our gut, okay, damage the lining of our intestinal walls. Um, this allows stuff like uh, leaky gut syndrome, which is a popular topic today to talk about. Um, it, they also become anti-nutrients, so these toxins will bind to our uh, vitamins and minerals and, and enzymes and they won't allow them to get uh, absorbed through the intestinal wall. There's really three different groups when you're talking about having a, a sensitivity to gluten. Right? Because not uh, everybody, like not the entire population is sensitive to gluten. And the first one is uh, the, the part of the population that suffers from celiac disease. Uh, and studies show today that that's about 1% of the U.S. population. Um, so what is celiac disease? It's, a, it's an autoimmune disease, all right, in which your body has an inflammatory response of when you intake gluten, right? The body notices that uh, you ingested a poison and it attacks it, all right? Uh, and with this comes a lot of uh, structural damage. The right? second category uh, of people, which is a much larger category, uh, is what we say is non-celiac gluten sensitivity. And that means that you don't have celiac disease, right? You don't have that autoimmune disease, but you still have a uh, sensitivity to gluten, okay? And the symptoms to this could be very similar or, or a little bit different, right? You could still have IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, right, uh, symptoms, or you can have much milder symptoms such as fatigue, uh, headache, uh, not able to concentrate, uh, loss of memory, lethargic, uh, joint pain, right? So it's a pretty wide range of of symptoms and symptoms that people suffer from uh, on a daily basis. The third and final group is just clearly people who tolerate right gluten. Uh, and there are people out there that do tolerate gluten. A lot of this has to do with genetics, right? Dr. Weston A. Price, who visited tribes all around the world, uh, found that there were tribes that were vital and healthy while eating gluten food. But the main point is that grains, right, have a tremendous damaging effect on your body. Um, as we've said, it, it damages the lining all right, of your stomach walls. Uh, it's an anti-nutrient, okay? Uh, and that's what makes its bioavailability so poor. If you were to look at a, a bioavailability scale, which means that um, the enzymes and the nutrients that are in that food are available to you. So for example, uh, grass is a extremely nutrient-dense food but uh, humans don't eat grass, right? Because it's not bioavailable to us. Cows eat grass. Cows have uh, rumens in their stomach which ferment that grass and break it down before it actually even enters the digestive tract. We don't have that ability. So for example, grains are not so bioavailable to us because of what we talked about. It, it produces phytic acid, it's an anti-nutrient, it binds to our min minerals and our enzymes and our, uh, and our vitamins, and it doesn't allow it to get absorbed through the intestinal wall. Also, if you were to just look at a nutrient density scale, okay, you would see that grains are the lowest on the list, right? Um, just about every other food out there is above grains, from wild meats and wild fish to nuts and seeds and oils and uh, vegetables, fruits, right? J dairy, just about everything that you could think of has a higher nutrient density than grains. So the question is, you know, why do we eat these grains? Um, well, one, they taste good, okay? Everybody loves their breads and their pastas and their, uh, their oats and their rice, right? Um, but besides that, it's also this myth that like you need to eat grains to, to get your fiber, which is not true at all, right? 
Um, human species has been around for 2.5 million years. Okay, we, our consumption of grains really didn't kick off. Okay, until about 10,000 years ago, which was the start of the you know agricultural revolution, which we stopped being nomadic and and hunting in the wild, and we became sedentary. We stayed in one spot and we planted our own foods and we uh, domesticated our own animals. Okay. But when you're talking about 2.5 million years and 10,000 years, all right, that's less than 0.5%. I mean, it's a blip in evolutionary, uh, you know, time. There is no need to, to eat grains for your fiber sources. The best thing that you can do, all right, is eliminate gluten and therefore eliminate grains from your diet. There's no need for them. There's only harm that can come from eating them. Um, I guarantee that if you eliminate grains, that you will see a drastic difference okay, in your overall digestion and energy levels. Um, I guarantee you also see you know, uh, a weight loss because of the inflammatory process. Our bodies are just constantly inflamed from the toxins that we're putting into it. All right, food group two that you need to eliminate from your diet is partially hydrogenated oils. So what the heck is partially hydrogenated oil? This can be a pretty confusing topic if you don't have a, a good understanding of fats and their molecular makeup. Um, if you really wanna dive into this topic and, and learn more about it, I recommend the book uh, Know Your Fats by Mary Enig. But for now, it's important to know that all fats are made up of triglycerides, okay? Tri meaning three, and glyceride meaning attached to a glycerol molecule. Uh, we know that those tri, or those three fatty acids, um, are saturated fatty acids, monounsaturated fatty acids, and polyunsaturated fatty acids. Partial or full hydronization uh, is the process of taking polyunsaturated fats okay, and making them more saturated. All right, so we know that m the majority of our poly uh, unsaturated fatty acids are our industrial seed oils, right? Our cotton oil, our soybean oil, our canola oil, uh, sunflower, safflower. Now here's an example. You wouldn't want to bake cookies or cakes uh, with canola oil or sunflower oil. Your cookie would turn very uh, moist, wet, right? It wouldn't look like the, the normal cookie today. So in order to make shortenings and margarines and, and things that the, the baking industry can use to, to bake goods, uh, they have to make these polyunsaturated oils okay, more saturated and they use this process called partial hydronization. So what they do is they add hydrogen okay, uh, at extreme pressures, okay, which turns a liquid oil into a more uh, solid fat. The problem with this process is the productions of trans fatty acids. Trans fatty acids are known as molecular misfits because they don't actually fit into any of the three uh, fat categories. A tricky subject, okay, but when you look at the, at the molecular makeup, right, the, the actual carbon chain, okay, during this process of partial hydronization, okay, the two double bonds actually flip on each other. So even though it technically becomes a monounsaturated or a saturated fatty acid, it's, it's, it's a fatty acid that the body no longer recognizes. Um, and what this does is this creates inflammation in the body, okay, and trans fatty acids is linked, okay, as a causative factor to almost every chronic disease uh, that we currently suffer from. Your best bet is to eliminate any foods that have a labeling of uh, partially or full uh, hydronated oils or uh, even trans fatty acids. Food group number three, it's the obvious one, right, it's refined sugar. I think it's important to say that sugar is not a bad thing and it really does get a, a bad rep. So my goal isn't to just to say that that, you know sugar is bad because it's not the issue that we run into today is the excess amount the unlimited supply of refined sugar it's hidden in almost every you know processed food that we have in the grocery store today uh, using terms like natural sweeteners or natural flavors or high fructose corn syrup uh, some way they've managed to stick it in almost every food uh, and drink that the average person consumes. As we already talked about, there have been plenty of cultures in history that have thrived on a, a high carbohydrate diet and therefore a, a higher sugar diet. Uh, but the issue is that, that one, they had the genetics for it, right? They, they ate the food that uh, the environment provided for them. So it's not like they had a grocery store that had every food in the world right down the block and they can eat in excess. Uh, and then two is that they ate it in its most natural state, right? So they were able to not only get that sugar, but they, they had it with, you know, a high uh, nutrient density. So with eating that apple, they also received 
uh, all the vitamins, minerals, and enzymes that came with that apple. I think it's pretty common knowledge uh, nowadays to understand that a diet high in sugar, right, is going to lead to an excess weight gain on the body. But it's important to know that it's not just about physical appearance, right? It's not just about weight gain. There are, there are many other internal issues that are going on. Uh, a great book to read is called uh, The Paleo Cure, written by Chris Cresser. He has a great section of, in his book in which he goes over refined sugar and he shows you how uh, an increased um, consumption of, of sugar can lead to insulin resistance, which of course is associated with diseases ranging from um, Alzheimer's, uh, heart disease, diabetes. He shows you that it can cause uh, digestive tract issues because uh, bacteria, right, love the consumption of sugar and, and therefore it can cause an overgrowth in your small intestine. It suppresses the immune system. It decreases tissue elasticity and function. It interferes with nutrient absorption. It causes tooth decay and uh, decreases growth hormone levels. It contributes to depression and mood disorders and it increases the chances of uh, uh, cancer and almost every other chronic disease uh, that we suffer from. Your best bet is to eliminate refined sugar from your diet uh, entirely. This is a, a difficult process to do if you're still consuming processed foods uh, because of the ways that it, it's hidden in almost all your processed foods. Start eating wild again, all right? Eat from foods that grow from the environment. Uh, the best foods out there are ones that don't have uh, a label that don't have an ingredient list. So there you go guys, eliminate refined sugars from your diet, you're gonna see a drastic difference in uh, your energy and, and your overall uh, weight loss goals. If you like the video, uh, consider subscribing uh, as well. Leave a comment down below, all right? Let me know uh, what other foods you think should be eliminated from the diet. Uh, that's all we have for now. Uh, next week we have part three. I'm gonna give you the three ways to increase your overall nutrient density in your diet. All right, hopefully you're one step closer to learning how to thrive. Peace.